Over the course of my studies in theoretical physics, I've traveled across the continent and around the world sampling new ideas and tasting different answers to the questions of how and of why. And still, I find there remains a deep hunger which lives within me, a burning desire to share these great ideas with the people around me. And so, I have assembled a team of some of the greatest, most lucid, most creative minds I've encountered in my travels. And I call them my Titanium Physicists. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast. And I'm Ben Tippett. And now, Allez, Physique! I wasn't sure where the idea came from, so I looked the etymology up. It's a very old word, going back to the old English days. The verb version of it describes the action of bending or twisting something out of shape, but also to throw or fling something. And as a noun, it's like a weaving word describing how threads are woven into a fabric. Here we are, popularized as the noun phrase warp speed by 1960s TV series Star Trek. Yeah. Miguel Alcubierre, when he was a graduate student, he got clever. He was inspired by the idea of a warp drive from Star Trek, and he derived a mechanism for faster-than-light travel using the framework of general relativity. Faster-than-light, you say? That's impossible. Well... Einstein's theory of gravity is built on the idea that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But Einstein's laws have some loopholes, and Alcubierre's supposed space-time geometry, called the warp drive or a warp bubble, skillfully chains these loopholes together to let us effectively break the speed of light. So is it feasible? Is it possible? And how does it work? Today, we're going to talk about the Alcubierre warp drive. Engage! So, today, my guest is Zach Wiener-Smith. Hi, Zach. What? He's the author of the webcomic Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, and he's also the co-host of our sister podcast, The Weekly Wiener-Smith. So, Zach, is it good being up and podcasting again? Oh, it's, it's awesome. I, I, I spent like two weeks as a nomad across the country, and it was hell. I ate a lot of Taco Bell. <laughs> so, Zach, for you today, I've got the A-team. Dr. David saying, arise! <laughs> Dr. Dave did his undergraduate at UBC with me, and he did his PhD and master's degree at Cornell. He's currently at Caltech working as a postdoc astrophysicist. Now arise, Dr. Jocelyn Reed! <laughs> Dr. Jocelyn did her undergraduate at UBC, her PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and she's currently at the University of Mississippi working on neutron stars. All right, um, begin the show! Engage! So, Zach, yeah. are you familiar with the speed of light? I am. <laughs> so, the idea here is Einstein proposed that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. He got clues from the physics that came before him and from some experiments. He took that one assumption and built the theory of special relativity, which predicted all sorts of things like that time would move slower the faster you traveled, all of these very familiar concepts. Which you make use of whenever you take advantage of handy-dandy GPS signals. Oh, yeah, GPS signals need a correction for relativistic motion. The kicker here is he incorporated this idea together into both special relativity and also general relativity, his theory of gravity. As an ironclad law, the idea that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light kind of becomes an iffy concept because it turns out that there are different ways that you can exceed the speed of light in general relativity. The idea here is that in the framework of general relativity, where things like motion are a little bit more relative, you can get away from it. There's one clear place where things violate this speed limit on the universe all the time. So the rule in general relativity is that locally, in your vicinity, nothing is going to travel faster than the speed of light. But 
The deal with the expansion of the universe is that the farther you get from us linearly, the faster you're moving away from us. So if millions of light years away from us, other galaxies are receding from us at a speed linear to their distance away from us. So if something's twice as far away from us in the sky, uh, it will be, as a general rule, moving twice as fast away from us. And the reason for this, in essence, is that the space-time distance is kind of bubbling up between us. And so it's not that objects are actually receding from us, it's that the volume of space-time is naturally increasing. And so even though we're not moving relative to one another, it seems like we're moving apart because the distance between us is increasing over time. So if I took a spaceship to a galaxy, would the expansion of the universe affect the amount of time it would take to get there? Yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's right. Over the time of you traveling between the two galaxies, the distance between them will have increased. So it's kind of like chasing a dog that's running away from you. The amount of time it takes to chase it is also dependent on how fast the distance between you is changing and not just the original location of you and the mm. dog. Sorry, it's more like the dog is on one of those conveyor belt things they have in airports and the dog just is standing there, but it's moving <laughs> away from you. You know, so the dog isn't like running away. It's just sort of sitting there with his tongue out, staring at you, wondering why you're getting farther away. Yeah, the, the canonical example is ants sitting on the edge of a balloon that we're inflating. So the ants aren't wandering along the surface of the balloon, but the volume of the balloon and the area of the balloon is increasing. And so the, the ants are getting farther apart, even though they're not moving in precise terms. And so the natural consequence of the fact that the rate at which they're moving away from us increases linear with distance is that there's a distance away from us right now. There's some galaxy that is hundreds of millions of light years away. The distance between us is increasing at the speed of light. And there should be galaxies beyond that distance. We'll never see them because the volume of the universe is increasing faster than light can can cross the gap between us. And it's so, accelerating? So right now, you may remember from our very first podcast about the big rip, where we talked about the Hubble expansion of the universe. Uh, so for each megaparsec you are away, you're moving away from us at about 70 kilometers per second. So uh, if you take the speed of light and divide by that, that tells you how far away the horizon is, or basically where a galaxy would be expanding away from us at the speed of light. Can I ask you a question about that? So say I was in space, and I had, say, two rocks, and each rock was attached in the middle to a dynamo, such that as they pulled apart, they spun the dynamo, and then I just let it sit for 10 trillion years. Would I get free energy out? By the expansion of the universe? Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. it's, 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 and if energy, so, where does it come from? It's energy in the space time itself. So it, it, the universe has momentum in a sense. It's coasting. So if I did that, would I be slowing down the universe? Yeah. Gravity does that already. Uh, so the gravitational attraction is trying to slow down the expansion of the universe. Right. Mm. Cosmology is another day. <laughs> so the moral of the story here is that... Even, even though on local scales, everything's obeying the speed of light limit, once you have general relativity and macroscopic structure of space-time, then you right. can start having what is, in a certain sense, faster than light travel, and that the relative distance between things yeah. can be changing. Things can move away from us faster than the speed of light after they're past this Hubble horizon. The idea here is that in general relativity, sometimes you can manipulate the evolution laws of your space-time so that the distance between two objects is decreasing faster than the speed of light, even though the objects themselves aren't actually moving. Right. So perhaps we should point out that the, the point is that you can't move relative to your local space-time faster than the speed of light. That only talks about sort of the local sort of fabric of space-time around you. If the space between you and that distant observer is expanding, you can appear to be moving relative to that observer faster than the speed of light because the of space course, itself is moving. In this case, all the nice laws of causality and no time travel and stuff are, are fine. The way this happens doesn't end up creating any sort of a causal loops that are a known danger of faster than light travel, as you might recall from our time travel episode. <laughs> Okay, so with this in mind, let's talk about how Alcubierre did it. So one of the fundamental, really interesting things about general relativity as a field is that Einstein didn't put forward a set of laws exactly. So Einstein's theory of general relativity is actually a relationship between space-time curvature and the matter distribution in the space-time. 
And ordinarily, physicists say, okay, we know what kind of matter there is here. It's a particular type of dust, and we know its distribution, and we know the initial gravity set up, and then you can use Einstein's general relativity to evolve this system into the future. But alternatively, you can say, what if this universe is shaped like this, and shape yourself a geometry, and then use Einstein's equations to determine what kind of matter is required to generate that geometry. So you can either solve Einstein's equations and talk about gravity from the ground up, or you can do it from the top down, and that lets you do things like build time machines, or in this case, warp drives. And so Alcubierre's warp bubble is actually kind of clever. He said, okay, take a spaceship, and then imagine that there's a sphere surrounding the spaceship. And then he described what the geometry just outside of that sphere looked like. He said, let's make this dynamic geometry in a way so that the space-time right in front of your spaceship is shrinking really, really quickly, and the space-time behind your sphere is expanding. And the net effect of these expansions and contractions is that your sphere ends up getting sucked forward. So the, you get propelled forward by the expansion of space into the uh, condensed space. Something like that? Yeah, that's right. So right. It's like a jet engine for space little, time. Yeah, you're, you're floating in a little bubble and then the space is warping around you similar to the way it does in the expansion of the universe. The bubble kind of acts like a jet engine for space time. It sort of sucks it up the front and sort of expands it out the back. And this does this warp the spaceship? No, that's the kicker. The person on the inside in the spaceship doesn't actually feel any acceleration. So you'd put on a blindfold so you couldn't see anything, maybe earplugs so you wouldn't hear anything. You couldn't tell that you had left, even though your spaceship is traveling through the heavens faster than the speed of light. What do you see if you look out the window? If outside the bubble there's a rock floating, what does it look like to you when you go forward? Yeah, we were talking about that. How does the light path travel through the, the warp bubble? Yeah, so it, it's kind of surprising. Initially, when I started reading about this, I kind of assumed that it would be like if you were in a car and you travel 50 percent the speed of light and a rock hits your windshield, it will hit your windshield with 50% the speed of light moving the other way. And the closer you get to the speed of the right, the faster things that you hit go. But in the Alcubierre warp drive, what'll happen is objects will be <laughs> blue shifted, so they'll feel an acceleration as they move into your warp field. Well, this isn't objects. This is the light from the object. The light the from the object. Right. Okay, so in general relativity, we talk about two different types of things in the space-time. We talk about things that travel naturally at the speed of light, with no mass. And then we talk about objects that have some mass and have to move less than the speed of light. I would have naively expected that since an external observer sees your spaceship traveling faster than the speed of light, I would expect you to hit pebbles and gravel and stuff out in the cosmos at a speed faster than the speed of light. But that's not actually what happens. It gets a slight acceleration as it moves into your bubble. And so a rock that's sitting still when your bubble hits it will get a slight velocity, but it'll be moving slightly less fast than you as you move through space. And it will kind of float past your ship and then decelerate on the way out. So it'll pick up, it'll accelerate as it's entering the front of the system and then float past you at a constant velocity and then decelerate on the way out the back and then go back to sitting still. So there's two important things. One thing is that nothing gets accelerated an infinite amount as it moves into your warp bubble, which is kind of surprising. And the second thing is that nothing that travels through your warp bubble picks up any net acceleration from the system. Of course, this is assuming that the rock can float happily through whatever is creating your warp bubble. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like the insects that hit your windshield hit your windshield at a speed faster than the speed of light. So wait, wait if the insect hits your windshield and splats into your window, is it now part of the ship or is it part of the warped space? Then it will be part of the ship. I mean, it's never part of the space. But, but I mean... It floats through the space that, that your, your ship is sitting in. So it floats from normal space through the extreme warping of the bubble, uh, Where through the warp gets, space of the bubble. It probably gets torn apart by tidal forces going through the warp Yeah, space I would imagine that it's pretty, yeah. yeah, yeah, the yeah there's has to there's probably a just short. a fine mist of insect emerging. If you if you shot a baby at it, there wouldn't be a baby coming out. Not even when it decelerated on the other end? The extreme curvature required means that you probably don't get baby on the other side. It'd get <laughs> squished. It would all be in one piece, but that piece would be all squished up. Yeah, so you'd have, like, you might be able to put like a water balloon or something that could regain its shape through it, not it would a baby. Have to be a or very an super elastic water balloon. Well, we're in space, Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs>
water balloon technology may have improved by this point. That's right. So wait, if I, if I wanted to run a, a factory that vaporized things, could I do it for free by just having a tube in warped space and just throwing stuff in one end and getting it on the other? If you had... It, That's this probably would be the, easier to construct than the yeah. Alcubia drive. Yeah, if you, if you <laughs> built this warp field, you'd have better things to do than to act as a trash compactor. But space can do that. Yes. <laughs> we have the space. tensor technology. Space is very good at squishing things. Yeah. Would it tear things apart on the other side? I guess it would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so it depends on how yeah. wide the, the field is, the warp field, and I guess. How, how big the thing is moving through the field. Yeah. Right, so right. if you're if you're smaller comparable to the, the size of this sort of warp field, uh, the thickness of the bubble, if you want, then you'll be fine. If you're much larger than that, you'd be squished up on the way in and sort of spread out on the way out. So amoebas are fine, blue whales not so fine. Right. It's like imagining things going over a waterfall. Little things do okay, but the big things feel big acceleration across their body, and that squishes them up. Um... So we've talked about this geometry of space-time that has all these cool effects, but now we have to go back to the other side of Einstein's equations and say, that what does this geometry imply for the kind of stuff that's making it? In other words, why don't we have these now? So I said before that in Einstein's general relativity theory, you could start with a geometry and then use the Einstein equations to tell you what kind of matter it would take to build that geometry. So in the Alcubierre warp drive, the matter is kind of distributed in a donut shape surrounding your moving with its hole towards the direction you're traveling. The axis, the axis of the donut is pointed in the direction you're traveling. But the unfortunate thing is all of the matter that's required is totally unlike any matter we have ever seen before on Earth. Hmm. So there are these things called the classical energy conditions, and they kind of describe a system that's pre-quantum mechanics, uh, which is what the word classical means in front of it. But in essence, they're conditions that we use to interpret the different types of matter in general relativity. So they say things like, in this matter, nothing, sound waves in the matter or the matter itself can move faster than the speed of light. That's one of the rules. Another rule says, gravity is always attractive. Another rule says energy density is always positive. So any any time we interact with energy, it's always positive energy. There's no such thing as cold. There's only such thing as heat, right? So the problem with this warp drive is that we need a donut essentially, of negative energy density. Yes, so the point is that since the space-time is contracting mightily in the front of your warp bubble and then expanding extremely in the back of your warp bubble to carry you around, then there has to be something very attractive pulling it in, but also there has to be something repulsive pushing the matter away. And that's hard to do with the kind of standard matter that obeys the classical energy conditions. And the classical energy conditions were basically made to spoil the fun of people who thought up hypothetically cool solutions of Einstein's equations. And then people would come over and say, nope, sorry, you violate those energy conditions. You can't play that game. That's right. So you you need something with repulsive gravity in order to expand space-time like this. And such a thing would have a negative energy density. And we're not aware of any normal matter that has this property. Or at least we weren't. Are we? We weren't. Well, it's not. We're aware of some nothing that has this property. Exactly. Nothing has this property. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we have to explain this so that the pun is hilarious to everybody. That's the way to get so, it to be funny is to explain it. Right. Well, <laughs> that, that always works for puns, right? So we are aware of sort of a local tabletop experiment that does possess this negative energy density. It's called the Casimir experiment. In this case, you put two plates really, really close together. And by mm-hmm. plates here, we're talking about very flat surfaces, not like plates. Dinner plates. Not dinner right. plates. Yeah, they're mirrors. Right. right. So you put two sheets of metal together. And then what happens is that they feel a force pushing them together. Feel the that... force pulling them together. They feel a contractive yeah force. It's like, it's as if some hands are pushing them together. So what this comes from is from quantum mechanics, we know that everywhere around us, that there's vacuum fluctuations of quantum energy. And when you put these plates close together, it turns out that certain wavelengths of vacuum fluctuations aren't allowed because they uh, don't fit between the plates. Exactly. They don't fit between the plates, but outside the plates, those modes are allowed. So you end up having less potential modes 
inside the plates than outside the plates, which gives you less energy inside the plates than outside the plates. And that, that larger energy externally pushes inwards and squishes those plates together. And that so, difference in energy is actually negative energy density. Suppose I had two giant plates and I put some piezoelectrics between them and I sucked energy off when they crunched together. Where does the energy come from? Technically, it has to do with how you built the system initially. Because technically, I think you might have had to do work to get the system into the configuration that it lies in. Because you, you can't exert work from it. You're right. So yeah. these mirrors, if you let them, will just squish together as a result of these vacuum fluctuations on the outside exceeding the vacuum fluctuations on the inside. So you do get work out of it. Yeah, you can, I think. What, what I don't get is the, the work you're talking about just to build the system, that, that energy is somewhere else now. You use that up. That's finite. Yeah. Yeah, so then you, you, get, you get the vacuum energy. And so presumably you could just suck electrons off the system. The work that's generated in squishing the crystal is, is what causes the electrons to come out of the crystal and that work comes from potential energy that you put in the system in building it so imagine that you have a room full of bees okay <laughs> so the bees are bouncing around all oh, you, you've made them mad and they're bouncing off every surface randomly and there's different sizes of bee okay so these bees represent the natural vacuum fluctuations so you have this room full of bees and you decide to take uh, two pieces of cardboard, and you kind of put them close together, and the bees, as they fly around randomly, will bounce off the cardboard. And let's say they're different sized bees. There are big, heavy bees and tiny little bees that are light. If you put the cardboard pieces close enough together, only little bees will fit in between them, okay? So you'll have big bees and little bees bouncing off them from the outside, but in between this cardboard sandwich, only little bees can bounce back and forth. And that means that since the big bees are so much heavier, these two cardboard pieces are going to feel a net force towards one another because the little bees can't push hard enough as they're bouncing back and forward in between the two pieces of cardboard to counter the force of all the heavy bees bouncing in from the outside. And these two cardboard pieces will close in on each other. And that's essentially what the Casimir vacuum is. Let me extend the metaphor, because what <laughs> physics tells us in this metaphor is that the universe is full of bees. Everywhere in the universe, there are just bees, <laughs> a whole bees, range of bees, bees everywhere. naturally. Bees of all sizes. Two bees millimeter of all sizes. sizes. Two millimeter size bees, Tyrannosaurus sized bees. Bees all on where the you scale can't see them. The Invisible universe. bees. Invisible bees buzzing everywhere. At so, your eye, away from your eye. Listen, there's even a bee inside your eye, guys. <laughs> Make sure you blink regularly. An infinite but number of bees. The bees in your need to stay moist. But the point is, because there are bees everywhere, we define that as our reference. We're just used to these bees, where again, bees are actually vacuum quantum fluctuations. But because we're used to the bees everywhere, we define that to be zero. That's nothing. Right. And then when we restrict the bees by putting in those plates. Because so we don't give a shit. We're like honey thing. badgers. Bees everywhere, that's not. So. In the universe, there are bees and there are honey badgers, and we're the honey badgers, and we don't <laughs> notice the bees because we don't care. But what it means is, when we look at these two cardboard pieces, we don't notice all the bees around. We just say, hey, these cardboard pieces are sticking together. Like magic. Like magic. So how, how close together do they, they have to be closer than, like, the wavelength of, of light? <laughs> the amount of energy that you can get from this changes depending on the separation of the plates. So if you have it closer and closer together, you're excluding more and more long wavelength modes. So the closer they are together, the stronger the force is. So how come they don't get infinitely strong? There is a finite amount of energy that you can get by letting these plates come together. And it's basically just you've changed the zero point, if you want, of the universe. So, so the point is that there's a there's a finite amount of energy that you can get. And this is predicted by Casimir. So could you make a sphere shape that would do the same thing, but in all directions? They measured this in 2001, I think, precisely. Yeah, about then. Interesting. So where, where does right. that, how does that let us warp space in our spaceship? That energy in the Casimir effect is technically negative energy because it's a... Uh, it's a negative energy compared to the previous uh, vacuum energy. The short answer would probably be nobody knows yet. Yeah, yes, nobody checked. really knows. And if that behaves like a negative energy in terms of Einstein's equations, then something like that could possibly act in a repulsive gravitational fashion. So if we only allow, like, you know, very tiny bees in our bee space-time fabric, then that, that, that little space of tiny bees would act like negative energy. Yeah. So some people actually looked into this, and they tried to calculate what would happen if you used quantum mechanics in a way like this, or maybe through some other way, to make a negative 
energy shell to work as the warp bubble. And then they could use this model to, to run some numbers. So you're familiar with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and one consequence of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that you can get away with having a system that has negative energy, but the amount of negative energy your system has is constrained by the amount of time you're measuring over. So if you measure for a really long time, chances are you can only see a very, very small amount of negative energy. And if you measure for a very short time, you can see potentially more negative energy. So they took advantage of this and they said, well, okay, so what kind of a system would we need to create to let us have an allowable amount of negative energy that would let us build one of those, these Alcubierre warp drives? And the answer is you'd have to make a very, 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 very thin shell so that the width of your warp bubble, so that the transition between the outside and the inside of your warp bubble is very, very quick, almost uh, the plank length in width. So so a plank length is roughly about 10 to the minus 35 meters. I, it's just like impossibly small, right? Yeah. Like you can't, there's nothing really you could, you can't really compare two things to say, okay, this is the plank length compared to this thing. Like if you compare the size of the universe to a nanometer is comparable for one meter to uh, plank length. So it's like <clears throat> impossible to imagine small, but theoretically possible. So if you built one of these bubbles, and then try to move at the speed of light, how much energy would that take? So this is the question they answered in this paper, and they found that it would take 10 to the 20 times the mass of the galaxy, negative kilograms. <laughs> it would take more energy, more negative energy than positive energy exists in the universe today. So, in other words, if you wanted to try to make one of these warp drives using a Casimir quantum negative energy source, it would take an impossible amount of negative matter. It would take a lot of emo teenagers to generate that amount of negative energy. It would have a very strict bee-free zone. <laughs> um, but the positive side is it doesn't always take an impossible amount of negative energy to create a, a, one of these warp bubbles. The people who wrote this paper that I was referring to also calculated the amount it would take if the transition between the outside of your bubble and the inside of your bubble was like a meter. And if it's a meter, it would only take a quarter of the negative mass of the sun, All right. which is Still impossible. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not impossible to imagine that much mass. Right. Well, in Star Trek, they had the crystals. No. So we well, just need some like, of that. Yeah. So if we can ever figure out a place where we can actually get our hands on something that's gravitationally repulsive. That's the size of a quarter of the sun, like your mom. So we know from the fact that our universe is accelerating that there's some kind of dark energy that's causing it to expand. And it might be this vacuum energy we've been talking about, but it might be something else. You know, there might be some kind of weird particle floating out there in deep space that's gravitationally repulsive. And we don't see it because it's repulsed itself from our galaxy. And if we could find that and shovel that and, and make a nice little igloo around our spaceship, then we could use warp drive. Right. It sounds like the physics student speculating about getting a prom date or something. Is it likely <laughs> I, to ever happen? I had a prom date. Yeah, it depends if the physics student's a female. <laughs> Possible. <laughs> it's theoretically not impossible. Actually, I didn't really have a prom date. <laughs> I, I got asked to the prom, but I was scared of boys, so I said no. <laughs> well, I had a, a Star Trek-related question coming in. Yes. When the Enterprise goes around space, does it leave behind, like, a wake of screwed-up space? No. I don't think they use this. Only method. in that shell. Only in that shell. Yeah, so the the kicker with this Alcubierre shell is that all of the matter generating the geometry follows the bubble along, so it doesn't leave a wake of any matter behind it. Uh. It's not actually like a rocket where you shoot off matter. So, so far the picture I painted of this warp bubble is pretty cheery, like as if it's possible. All we need to do is find this special type of matter and then we can travel faster than the speed of light. But more recently, someone's come up with a very persuasive argument that if you tried to ride in one of these Alcubierre warp bubbles, you'll be cooked to death. And the argument is fascinating. It is as follows. So... Oftentimes when you talk about relativity, especially to somebody for the first time, you bring up the argument of, what if you were riding on a photon, what would you see? So imagine that you're inside this warp bubble, and you're just throwing flashlights around. You've got laser pointers, say, and you're throwing them this around the ship and watching the laser point come back at you. If you throw light 
towards the front of your ship, you can argue that there has to be a boundary in the front of the ship past which even light can't pass. Because what happens is, if you move slightly outside of, of the front of your warp bubble, space-time is being eaten by the front of your warp bubble faster than the speed of light. It'll be impossible for a photon to travel into that wake, because the medium's traveling into the warp drive faster than the, the photon can move outwards. So there has to be a point at which the, the photon will sit still and come to rest. And similarly, if you threw a, a flashlight out the back of your warp drive, just beyond the edge of your warp bubble, there's a place where uh, space-time is receding from the warp bubble faster than the speed of light. And what that means is a photon just outside the warp bubble trying to move back in towards you isn't moving fast enough to be able to climb back into the warp bubble. So you have these two boundaries. On the front of the ship, there's going to be a little disk where it's impossible for photons to travel out through the front of it. And it's impossible for photons to move back in from the from the back side of it. In other words, it's like your little uh, warp bubble has two one-way mirrors. Uh, there's a one-way mirror at the front of it that keeps light from going out the front of it. And then there's a surface at the back that keeps light from moving back into the warp bubbles. And these two surfaces work just like the surfaces of a black hole and a surface of a white hole. So you know you know what a black hole is. You've heard of black holes. Yes. Uh, and a white hole is a time-reversed black hole. So a black hole, anything that falls into it won't be able to come out. So it's um it's described in terms of this surface that's it's like a one-way mirror. Stuff can fall in through the surface but can't climb out. And similarly, a white hole is a surface that things can come out of but can never go back into. Well, things can approach it, but they'll sort of get yeah, jammed they, up they'll before they enter. They'll always bounce off uh, and get repelled from it. At the very best, uh, a beam of light could kind of approach it and never quite touch the surface again. So what these physicists did is when they recognized that there's this surface that looked like a white hole and a surface that looked like a black hole, is they could apply the physics of white holes and black holes to this system. And as it happens, in a black hole, there's something called Hawking radiation, and it's named after Stephen Hawking. And the idea is that if you have one of these one-way mirrors, if stuff can only fall through it, but can't move back out of it, like the surface of a black hole, one of these surfaces is going to generate radiation. And the reason it generates radiation has to do with uh, quantum effects again. And it's been described in a really cute way. The idea here is that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that the vacuum will, at random intervals and for brief periods of time, turn into an electron and a positron pair that will pop out of nowhere and then annihilate and disappear again. And this happens all the time everywhere. But if it happens really close to one of these horizons, what will happen is there are the positrons, for instance, will fall through the one-way surface. And then the other, the electron, will still be on this side of the, of the one-way surface, and they'll be separated. And they won't be able to come back together. And so, um, in effect, this one-way surface is generating kind of a bath of radiation that's just kind of spewing from it. And because in the system you have one surface that's generating uh, radiation, and the other surface that acts as a mirror that doesn't let any radiation pass through, what happens is the inside of your Alcubierre warp drive will get really, really hot. And this one-way surface on the front of it, all of the radiation will end up gathering there, because all the radiation will shoot out towards it and try to pass through it, but it will stop like cars at a traffic light. And so energy is going to build up on the front of it and also cook out the inside. And the question is, how hot will it get on the inside of this thing? And the numbers say it will get really, 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 really hot to the point that it's an um, unstable space-time. So the argument is that because of these quantum effects, if you ever had an Alcubierre warp drive that was moving faster than the speed of light, the geometry itself would just fill up with energy and cook itself out and destroy itself. That's a boomer. That's the sad fate of the warp drive. So it would make a great oven. Ah, uh, I'm a doctor, not a baker. You're a physicist, not a doctor. All right, everybody, we're going to end the show. That was wonderful. Thank you, <laughs> Jocelyn and Dave. You have pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Jocelyn, you get a breadfruit. <laughs> and Dave, you get a stale breadfruit. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Enjoy it. I'd like to thank my guest, <laughs> Zach Wienersmith. Zach, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for uh, your your metaphors. I hope we haven't tried your patience too much with stories about <laughs> bees. No, never. 
Uh, everybody, Zach has a website that you should visit. It's called Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial. It's a hilarious comic, and everybody loves it. And also, the Wienersmiths have podcast, the weekly Wienersmith, where they talk about intelligent things to intelligent people. You can email us if you'd like to get in touch with us at barn at titaniumphysics.com or you can follow us on Twitter at at titaniumphysics. You can visit our website at at www.titaniumphysics.com or look for us on Facebook. If you would like to leave a review on iTunes, it would increase the traffic to the show and people will find it more easily. If you have a question you'd like my titanium physicist to address, email your question to tiefighter at titaniumphysics.com. That's T-I-P-H-Y-T-E-R at titaniumphysics.com. And if you're a physicist and you'd like to become one of my titanium physicists, email physics at titaniumphysics.com. We're always recruiting the Titanium Physics Podcast as a member of Brachiolope Media. If you've enjoyed the show, you might also enjoy Science Sort of or the weekly Wienersmith. Please check them out. Right, Zach? Yeah. 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 The intro music is by Ted Leo, and the pharmacist and the end music is by John Vanderslice. Good day, my friends, and remember to keep science in your hearts. Angela, don't be mine. There's something I gotta tell you, dear, before you come back here. I lost, I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage He was eating spring mix on the carpet Jumped through a window out into the haze Hop down Magnolia Boulevard No way he'll survive <laughs> And, that, and that's what violates. Hold it together. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, warp bubble. Warp bubble. Say it again with warp bubble. Warp. <laughs> what, what did I say this time? I said ball. <laughs> Jocelyn. You said your ball is repulsive. It is repulsive. Oh, so repulsive. Anyway, next time. Just the one, though. Jocelyn, next time we do this, you're drinking out of Growler with only two X's on it. <laughs> they don't make those in Mississippi. Oh no! <laughs> Find a carpet bagger and get him to buy sell you <laughs> some cheap watered down booze. I think I might be a carpet bagger. I'm from. I, I don't think Canadians count them. No, no. I think carpet I beggars a, are. <gasps> they're Northerners that come down and and I don't know. Uh, spoil the. They, they sell tonics, right? Yeah. They 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 they, they, they invest and buy everything up and make money off the board. They put it all in a carpet bag and they take it down. That's the. Well, they came down with their carpet bags to take advantage of the economic destruction. Yeah. and Canadians uh, don't take advantage of anyone economically or sell, otherwise. So. Do they? Do they sell carpets? I I probably I I don't know. This is vague impressions. Is their I, carpet I, bag recursively full of carpets? I think Dave's asking. <laughs> I believe the bags are made of carpets. Oh, could you also be selling carpet bags out of your carpet bag? You could do that out of many. Um, you can do that out of many container items if you're selling containers. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, back back to your repulsive balls, Ben. Jocelyn, Maybe. you have to do this explanation because you laughed too hard. <laughs> okay. Say it with warp bubble. Warp bubble. Warp bubble, Jocelyn. Okay. Um, so imagine- Do you know there there actually are bees that are two millimeters in long? Yeah, I did. I did. I've, That's I've, amazing. I think I see tiny, one tiny, tiny bees. Yeah, little bees. Terrifying. And they have big ones. Have you seen Suzume bees? Suzume bashi? They're uh, Japanese sparrow bees. They're wasps, actually. They're sparrow dead. bees? Yeah, that's what they're called, because <laughs> they're big. And if they sting you, you die. <laughs> okay, what about this- the two millimeter bees? <laughs> I don't. I think they could probably two fly up your. Let's your, hold on, hold on. Let's all just stop and picture Macaulay Culkin's glasses falling into the woods. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, uh, that's the that's that happens in my girl. Yeah. No, I I got oh, it. Oh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I haven't watched that movie for a long time. Yeah, no, don't need to. All you need to remember is that Macaulay Culkin's fucking dead. 
I know. I was so happy. I don't have anything against Macaulay Culkin. That's because no, you're it's a girl. Sad. It's sad. <laughs> no, he deserved to die. Oh my god, <laughs> people are crazy. <laughs> okay, so you're like have... married to Mia Kunis now or something? <laughs> I don't know. Anyhow, <laughs> we're wasting Zach Weider Smith's time. <laughs> <laughs> valuable, valuable time. I could be shooting my wife right now. That's right. Okay. <laughs> With a Nerf gun, not... Well... <laughs> no, no. Keep that in, Ben. Don't don't add the uh, qualifier. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, here's a good metaphor I came up Does with. Does it involve bees? No, it's, it's for, for varying values of good. <laughs> it's the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> you go up to a high school kid and you're like, a warp drives, and he's like, whatever, if there's a speed limit. It's like going on a highway where you can't go past 100 kilometers an hour. You just can't break that speed limit. How are you going to do it? And here's how you do it. Suppose it was physically impossible to go faster than 100 kilometers an hour on this asphalt. What you do is you get a machine that laid down asphalt and was also able to remove asphalt and destroy it. And you put the part that removes asphalt in front of the machine and you put the part of ash that uh, builds the asphalt behind the machine. And then instead of traveling on the highway, confined to speed limit, your machine just eats the asphalt as fast as it wants to and lays down asphalt behind it as fast as it wants to. And in doing so, it doesn't actually travel on the asphalt. And so because it ever- subsequently... So your, your car is never the- breaking the speed limit. Your speedometer yeah. is just like zero. That's right. Yeah. And Well, and unless also- there's a lower speed limit on the highway, then you might be in trouble. Right. And this utilizes the well-known fact that uh, highway construction crews work much faster than the speed limit. That's right. 